Hey there, and welcome back to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about language, and specifically NLP is the Milton model versus the meta model. We talked a little bit about the meta model last week. Talk a little bit more about that today, and what's the difference between those two, and when and why should you use them? What are they good for? Stick around. It's really interesting. You're going to like this. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hey there, and welcome back. So the meta model versus the Milton model. The reason I'm interested in this this week is, well, I'm always interested in it because it's part of what I do. But last week, I talked about the meta model. And then between last week and this week, I started reading this book, which you may may not be able to see if this is just the audio version. So I'll tell you what it is. It's called The Origins of Neuro-Linguistic Programming. It's edited by John Grinder and Frank Pusilik um, for many, many years. I've operated under the belief and assumption that everything that people have told me was true, that uh, NLP was created by Richard Bandler and John Grinder, full stop, those two. Turns out there was a third guy, and it turns out there was, in fact, a whole bunch of people um, who have contributed to this book. Uh, Richard, I'm sorry, Robert Diltz is among them, uh, Stephen Gilligan among them, Judith Delosier among them, uh, some other really interesting people that I actually don't know. But um, Frank Pusilek was was chief among them. So I was reading Robert Diltz's um, chapter the other day, and he was talking about how in the early days of NLP and his, his experience of it, because he was around from the from the get go. Um, in fact, his his I think I don't know if it's a master's thesis or whatever, but he wrote the first book um, called NLP Volume One as part of his schoolwork at the University of Santa Cruz. And he was, uh, Richard Bandler was another student there. Um, John Grinder was a professor there. Frank Pusilek, I don't think he had any association with the, the college, but he was around those two guys. So Robert Diltz was a student and he took John Grinder's um, course. I'm not sure what the course was called. I, I could probably look it up and tell you, but suffice it to say, it was a course in linguistics. And the way Robert tells it on, on Thursday, of the of the week of his class, he taught the entire meta model, whatever that means, in a couple of three hours, you know, a couple of half hours, uh, two and a half hours, um, and then he set people loose into Santa Cruz. And Robert says that you know he was just naturally uh, kind of a chameleon type of person. He would sort of naturally match and mirror people, so he had rapport and. And he would talk to people like his aunt or his mother or various people. And he'd ask very good questions from the meta model in order to get lost information, this distorted, deleted, generalized information that people had not you know, specifically stated. And he would ask questions to retrieve that. And then they would have these amazing insights and you know, sort of therapeutic breakthroughs. It was, it was amazing. But most people didn't have that. You know, a, innate ability to have rapport like that. And, you know, say they were just charging ahead asking these questions like, well, how specifically do that? What, how specifically did you go to the store? You know, all these how specifically questions, you know, and people felt like they were being interrogated, you know, and, and just given the third degree. So it did not create rapport, let's just say. And um, <laughs> apparently there are a lot of rifts of the space-time continuum, or at least of relationships there in Santa Cruz that we can. So people came back. And on Tuesday for the following class with Grinders, with you know, the proverbial tails between their legs and many, many tails of woe. So um, according to Robert, Bandler and Grinder decided, hey, let's, uh, let's look into this rapport thing as a prerequisite, or at least the first step to doing the, the meta model. And again, I'm not sure exactly where Frank Pusilek was within that story, but uh, it got me thinking about... Um, about the meta model and how important, obviously, I think to you, I'm sure it is, uh, rapport 
is. You know, you do want to ask these really probing, important to ask questions, but you ask them in a way that is pleasant, <laughs> you know, and maintains a sense of connection and rapport with the person that you're talking to. Um, oh, just by the way, for those of you who are viewing this uh, this, this podcast, I want to say my, my, my sort of background or this frame around me here is um, is in honor of the season. It is, uh, for those of you who can't see it, it's fall foliage. So I've changed my background from the library. I think it's Dublin library. Um, but uh, I've changed it to a fall foliage because it's what is outside right now. It's not quite as colorful as what you see in the picture, but it's pretty nice outside here right now in the Northeast as I record this. It's a beautiful sunny day and there are lots of fall leaves falling. In fact, they are, I mean, it looks like it's just snowing, like somebody set up some sort of Hollywood machine to just make it look like it's fall and just because they keep just coming down. It's pretty amazing, but um, it's very pretty, beautiful day. So I just thought I'd put this in there to do a little homage to the season. Anyway, so we're talking about the meta model. So in the story that Robert Diltz tells, he goes on and says that after a few weeks, months, that um, another person who's instrumental in the early days of NLP, um, Gregory Bateson, who was a professor, one of the other professors at University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, in this case, he was a believed professor of anthropology. He was certainly married to Margaret Mead, at least for a long time, who was a famous anthropologist. I think he also could be said was a famous anthropologist. At any rate, he was friends with Bandler and Grinder. I think he might have been Bandler's neighbor or something like that. But he and Margaret Mead had had met and worked with Milton Erickson many years pre prior to this, when Margaret Mead was doing the study of trance dancing in Bali. So they would bring the movies that she'd filmed in Bali to Milton Erickson, and he did examine them, talk to them about um, you know this this phenomenon of trance dancing. And so um, Bateson said to Bandler and Grinder, "You you guys need to get your butts over to uh, to Phoenix." I'm not sure. He put it exactly like that, but it was his words to that effect. He said, get thee to Phoenix and meet this gentleman, Milton H. Erickson, MD, and uh, find out what he's doing in the hypnosis world. So they got some invitations through Bateson to go out there, and they did. And uh, they were there for a week. And they came back from Phoenix and their experience with, first experience with Milton Erickson, and they said, okay, we were wrong. It's not all about the meta model. It's really all about the Milton model. They made something else up. They've modeled, if they, if you will, um, Milton Erickson's way of speaking to people, and they called that the Milton model. And in effect, one way of looking at it, in effect, it is kind of the absolute reverse of the Milton model. In fact, it is a very common thing for NLPers to say that it is, it is that that the the Milton model is the opposite of the meta model. They are polar opposites. You, you purposely, you know, uh, disobey the rules of the Milton model, of the Mel meta model to do the Milton model. So the meta model is asking for more specifics. The Milton model is purposely vague. I think I might have mentioned to you last week that Dobson's rule um, was that the client is always specific, Dobson never. So Dobson Dave Dobson was a hypnotist, hypnotherapist, and um, although he probably would object to that title because he objected to most things, I think I said, but <laughs> he's a bit of a curmudgeon, Dave, lovable, but uh, snarly. But uh, at any rate, he was still a really, really great hypnotist, whether he wanted to be called that or not. And um, he he was of the, of the Milton Erickson camp there, that he was purposefully vague. So the rule, Dobson rule, he said this was that the client is always specific, Dobson never. So we want to be able to do that too. The beautiful thing about what Bandler and Grinder did, and I think both Erickson and Dobson would agree to this, is that they they made it intelligible. They made it replicatable. They, they, they found out what it was that, that Erickson and Dobson we're doing, and others, of course, Virginia Satir and Fritz Perls and Frank Fairley, 
uh, respectively, family therapy, gestalt therapy, and provocative therapy. They modeled these people and they kind of brought out, you know, the, the structure of what they were doing and made it so we could do it too. So the meta model is their structure of how do you ask good questions with rapport, of course, but good questions in order to retrieve lost information, information that has been lost is a funny word, but it's been deleted. In other words, if I just say it's good, you don't know what I'm talking about. What's good, right? It's a simple deletion. I just left it out of the sentence. It's great. Well, it's great. You know, it's still left out of the sentence. Um, it's a simple deletion. It's one of the forms, one of the meta model forms. So you would ask as a meta model, you'd ask, well, what's great? You'd ask a question in order to retrieve that information. So it's been deleted or it's been distorted or it's been generalized. Like everyone's wonderful today. Well, everyone's wonderful everywhere in the entire world, right? So it's a generalization. You try to bust it up and make it more specific. With the Milton model, you purposely get vague. So that means that the person has to go inside their mind, their unconscious, their conscious, whatever. They have to go inside to, to make connections in their brain to figure out what you're saying because you're being purposely vague. So they've got to fill in the blanks. So that little bit of filling in the blanks thing is trance. It's a light little trance, but it's a trance nevertheless. So you can use that purposefully in your communication. Now, some of us listening to this re recording today are hypnotists. So you know what I'm talking about, I hope. Um, if you don't, then start studying some Ericksonian language patterns. Uh, I'll, I can tell you well where if you if you don't know. Nevertheless, um, and by the way, Bander and Grinder's books are, are good places to start. Uh, their first book, The Structure of Magic, Volume 1, is all about the meta model and um, the patterns of Milton Erickson, Volume 1, um, also by Bandler and Grinder, is a great book all about the Milton model. So if you want to read about them, those are great books to, to pursue your study. Nevertheless, um, if you're a hypnotist, you probably know about these things already. If you're a coach and haven't studied hypnosis or NLP per se, perhaps this is relatively fresh and new to you. So that's great. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. I'm not going to do what Grinder did and tell you like everything in two hours because I'm not going to take two hours. I'm going to take, you know, 15, 20 minutes here today and give you some tidbits like I did last week. Um, I have in mind, you know, a couple of specific categories of what we call metamata violations, you know, where we can use succinct questions in order to get good answers back. And then I'll show you a couple of Milton model examples as well. So, the question really is, when do you use what and why? When do you use what and why? And then, of course, um, how? You want to know that one, too. So how do you use these things? When do you use them? Why do you use them? We've already covered why. We covered why because we want to know more. So when a person is being vague and spe unspecific, then we we want to know more. So we ask questions. We ask questions, Milton, I'm sorry, meta model questions to get more specific. I think I might've mentioned to you in the last episode about the meta model, that there is a universal meta model question that I learned from John Laval, which goes like this. It's, uh, what do you mean? Remember that? Uh, what do you mean? The, uh, may or not be necessary, but what do you mean is a great question. It can be pretty broadly contextualized. So if a person is doing an unspecified verb or an unspecified noun, and you say, what do you mean? They will probably be more specific by you asking that question. Um, so that's when, why, what. And with the Milton model, when you're wanting to utilize naturally occurring trances, when you're trying to do hypnosis, those are good places when you would do Ericksonian language patterns. And I'm tempted to tell you a little bit of a story here. In fact, I, I might as well go ahead and, and do so. I was working once with Christina Hall. Christina Hall is a wonderful NLP trainer, master trainer, whatever um, official title she has, but she's a trainer of NLP. 
and I took a language course from her on, on how to use Ericksonian slash NLP language. And um, she told us a story. She told us a story about how she was working with Richard Bandler at a seminar once. Richard Bandler was famous, sort of famous, well-known for giving confusing uh, directions during exercises. Part of the reason was this was planned. He wanted people to, you know, not just be following a step by step sort of rules and doing it right, but he wanted them to be in that space of exploration, like they were when they created NLP. They didn't know what they were doing. They're just trying to figure out what what Satir was doing, figure out what Fritz Perls was doing, figure out what Erickson was doing. They were just imitating them. You know, started talking like Fritz Perls with the Austrian accent and thinking that was why he was so good. That's his gestalt therapy because, you know, and of course, speaking with an Austrian accent had nothing to do with it, but they were just playing, finding out, exploring. Bandler wanted to sort of create that same environment in his classes, so he would give vague instructions, perhaps Milton model-like instructions for people to, you know, carry out this assignment and explore and discover. And many times things were discovered in classes that maybe weren't necessarily there before. There's another story, just as an aside. Um, one of my favorite NLP patterns is called the change personal history pattern, the change personal history pattern. And that came to be in a, in a class, like I've just described, where um, Bandler gave some instructions. And, and so people got off into groups to start working on it. And uh, they said, Okay, uh, Sally. I don't know the name of the person. Um, Sally, you go first. What's something you want to work? What's something you want to work on? What's a problem that you have? And she was like, "Well, I don't have any problems." And you know, like, well, what do you mean you don't have any problems? He said, "Well, whenever I have had a problem, I'll go back in my brain and back in my timeline and go back to that time when it happened, and I'll bring, you know, my up to date adult resources back into my childhood experience, and I'll change." my experience back in my mind. And so then I grow up with a whole new set of understandings of what life is about and what I'm capable of. And they went, cool. <laughs> we want to do that. So, so they modeled this ability of hers and they created this change personal history process. Mm -hmm. So Bander like to, I mean, yeah, Bander like to foster this spirit of exploration. Let's discover something new. So he gave purposefully vague instructions to people, and then he would let them explore it. So Christina Hall tells the story that she was in one of these seminars with Bandler, and he gave these instructions, and she didn't understand, and so she wanted clarity. So she went up to Bandler, and she said, Richard, I'm confused. I don't understand what we're supposed to do here. And he looked at her and said, that's right. Sometimes you can be confused and not know. Yet, continue to learn because your conscious mind is very smart and your unconscious mind also learns in a variety of ways. So, why not let it do the work for you for a while? And then he turned and walked away. And so if you listened to that, <laughs> that paragraph there, um, chances are you did what Christina Hall did, which is you went into a light trance. She was left standing there like, huh? But what's interesting about that, that paragraph is that if you parse it out and write it out, it's not that confusing. The reason it's confusing like that is because of the way he said it and the way he paused, you know, at certain places within the sentence structure, often not where you'd expect a pause, like and pause. So the person is waiting for what comes after and what comes after and what comes after and. So the way you use language can capture a person's attention, capture a person's attention. That's one of the breakthroughs of Ericksonian hypnosis versus traditional hypnosis. A traditional hypnosis um, based on the work of 
James Braid back in the 1850s, he thought like Mesmer, you know, you had to capture their attention. So he thought you could watch the watch swinging back and forth. That's where that comes from. So it captures their attention sort of thing. Also, um, he invaded what's known as the braid fascination device, which you've seen many times. It's that swirl thing that gets closer and closer into the vortex and it starts swirling and you go like, whoa, and you get your eyes captured in this attention. Erickson would capture attention as well, but he didn't use these devices. He used stories, he used language. He used this purposely vague way of talking that caused people to wonder what's coming next and be engrossed in the story, be engrossed in the language, or be engrossed what's being said so that he captured their attention and facilitated trance. Also, when they're kind of not sure which way is up, which way is coming next, then you can also recognize that they're open to embedded commands. So when a person has that bit of confusion going on and then you tell them something directly and use a kind of analog marking, to tell them this directly, they go, oh, okay, I got it. You know, they will they will basically go, I'm drowning in the sea of confusion. You throw them a lifeline, they grab onto it. So they'll grab onto what you tell them at that point in time. So you get them all confused and then they say, and then you say something like, and you can heal quickly now. And they go, yeah, I can heal quickly now. You know, they may not remember everything else you said, but they'll remember that. And in fact, they may forget consciously that you said that, but because it was so just a clear direction and a directive, they will latch on to it and it will become reality for them. So that's one of the things hypnotists do. They tell these engrossing, captivating stories that are somewhat confusing because of the way they're using the language in a purposely vague way. And then they give direct suggestions, or perhaps indirect suggestions, but nevertheless embedded commands, if you will, that tell the person what to do. Change now. You can grow and feel better. You can retrieve all the resources from inside and accomplish what you've decided, desired to do in life now. You can also recognize that Inside you now, there are all the resources you need. That's one of the things that Erickson truly believed that has come to the NLP world from Erickson, is that we have the resources inside us now to do and be and have anything in our lives. Now, it might not be just, you know, automatic, but you can get to it. You might need to practice, <laughs> you know, you might, might not be magic, but you can get to it. You can lose weight and keep it off. You can quit smoking forever. You can quit drinking forever. You can do these things that you want to do. You can maybe even grow an inch. I don't know about that one, but you know, who knows? Who knows? Who knows what's possible? I don't know what's possible, but it's nice to know that your unconscious mind does. And that when you use kind of Milton model, vague language, you know, you can begin to get in touch with the resources you need. Now, meta model versus Milton model is what our discussion is all about today. And I just want you to know that meta, I'm not sure where that name comes from. Milton model is about Milton Erickson. They're both about language. And the meta model is about getting more and more specific. Milton, Milton model is getting more and more vague. I promised you that I would talk a little bit about um, the meta model and a particular language pattern within the meta model, and I will do that now. I was fascinated again by re reading this book, The Origins of Neurolinguistic Programming by John Grinder, Frank Pusilic, and many other people, contributors to it. That the way um, Richard, I'm sorry, Robert Diltz talked about his experience there, that when they were developing the meta model, it took weeks, months for them to, to do that. And for a while, they people would meet every, every week at you know, Frank's house or John's house or Judith's house or, you know, somewhere, Richard's house. And they would have these weekly, you know, practice sessions. Every week they'd get together and practice. It's one of the reasons I'm doing this deep foundation NLP training right now, but because of this weekly desire to get better and at, at specific skills. This is how it works. You practice, practice, practice. So that's why we're doing it that way. They would meet every week 
at one of these people's houses and they would discuss, you know, one of these meta model situations. And, and it became almost like a meditation. They would, they would focus on it for like a week about, you know, this one particular aspect of the meta model and it changed their, their lives. I mean, the way Robert Diltz describes it, it was, it was really like mind blowing and mind altering life course altering. And one of the ones that I think is really profound in that way is the, the um, category of nominalizations. Now, what is a nominalization? You might be wondering, some of you know exactly what it is. A nominalization is a verb that has been turned into a noun. A verb that has been turned into a noun. Now, if that doesn't make it any clearer for you, let me give you an example. So if I was to say, um, in fact, this actually happened just a couple of days ago. I was working with a client and she said that she wants to really get a really good, strong relationship. She really is looking for a good, strong relationship. And I asked her, so what, what color are you looking for? And she said, well, what? So what, what color relationship? Did you want a purple relationship? Because I heard those are really good. Or you might want a red relationship or a white relationship or a black relationship. You know, they're, they're good too. Um, what color relationship are you looking for? Chartreuse? That's unusual, but you know, people like chartreuse. It's a very nice relationship if you can find it. I'm looking for a collection actually. She says, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I said, well, what are you talking about when you say you want a relationship? Can you take a relationship and put it into a shopping cart? Can you say, I'm gonna buy a relationship here and put it in a shopping cart and check out? No, it's not a thing. A relationship has no color. There's no thing, there's nothing. There's, it's, a, it's a verb. How do you relate? to another person. How am I relating with you? How do we relate with someone else? It, it's, a, it's a process. It's a verb. We're relating with each other. How do you want to improve your relations is a better question. You know, how do you want to relate better to your spouse, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend? You know, how, how do you want to do that? So she was like, huh. It's just exactly the response we're looking for in coaching and NLP. That's what the meta model does. It breaks up this expectation. This is in this case, it's a distortion, right? We've had deletions, we've had generalizations. This is in the case of the distortion because it's not what they are making it out to be. They're distorting their reality. And so this helps to undistort the reality, right? You can't have a relationship if it's, you can't go to the store and buy it at Relationships R Us and put it into your oversized cart and take it out to your checkout. You can't do it. So nominalizations is a really impactful meta model violation. If you can focus on that one alone, like what other examples of nominalizations are there? Well, frankly, nominalization is a nominalization, right? Let's, let me show you a nominalization. I've just got one back from the nominalization store and put it in this cart here. The test is, can you put it into your shopping cart? We used to use the, the metaphor, can you put it into a wheelbarrow until people started saying, well, what's a wheelbarrow? So, <laughs> I was talking with a student not too long ago about, you know, in the old days, there's a piano over there, I don't know if you can see it. Um, the old days of the, of the student was a young student and you, they couldn't reach the pedals or reach the keyboard or whatever. You'd, you'd, you'd get a telephone book out and have them sit on the telephone book and people going like, well, it's a telephone book, which is a great question. <laughs> I haven't seen one in a long time, but it's amazing how many trees died <laughs> to print these things over the years. Telephone books. I was remembering how there was, you know, strong men used to say, I can rip a telephone book in half. That is impressive. I don't think I could do it. Anyway, um, wheelbarrows, shopping carts. The test is, can you put your thing into a shopping cart or a wheelbarrow? If the answer is no, then it is not really a thing. It's a verb. Very often they end in T-I-O-N, like nominalization, uh, dem dem democra democratization, the democratization. People like to sound really smart by using nominalizations a lot. So you'll hear them a lot. And um, the question is basically, how do you turn it back into a verb? So you ask questions like, well, how specifically are you doing that? 
How are you democratizing? How are you making democracy work better? Instead of the democratization of this thing, how are you helping people to be more democratic in their voting situation? Questions like that. At any rate, I've come to the end of my half hour here. So I would like to thank you for being here. The meta model, like I said, is about how to get more specific information. And the Milton model is how to be purposefully vague for the intention of helping persons go into trance and to help to embed some commands for their, their benefit. You do this, all of this, of course, for the client's benefit, always. Use your genius for good instead of evil, as I think um, Superman once said or something to that effect. Thank you for being here. I look forward to seeing you at our next episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And by the way, you can always find out more at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Right now we're starting some new classes on a deep foundations NLP, and I invite you to join us there. Thanks. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks.